commentators I was reading as I was preparing for uh, my homily said that if Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the writer, had stopped after the even just the second chapter, we would have still called him an evangelist. And her point was that uh, in the way that Matthew, and Luke for that matter, but Matthew today, tells the story, it signals all of the, the, what, the what we know really about Jesus. Here, he tells about the Magi, we don't know. Some people call them kings, some people call them astrologers. All we know is they were not Jewish, and they were from the East, and they came bearing gifts. Um, so Matthew, in telling the story in this way, says, look, from the beginning, something's changing. Uh, already now, the nations are beginning to respond. Strangers, people we don't even know the name of are coming, are beginning to recognize, even in his infancy, that Jesus is worthy of worship, worthy of homage. So if Matthew, thank God, Matthew didn't stop after the second chapter, but, but you would have already begun to know that this, this child, this, uh, the incarnation of God, already has implications, not simply for the, the shepherds or the, or the angels or Mary and Joseph, but for the world. And, uh, and so they began to, to proclaim that. The, the readings today also point out that this is not a message. This, what Paul points out in that second reading, you remember from Ephesians, he said, it was not this mystery revealed to him by revelation, as you remember, he was a persecutor of the faith. But in, the, in his conversion, his life turned around. And he says, in the, in the uh, was made known by revelation to his holy apostles and prophets uh, by the Holy Spirit that the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, co-partners to the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's new news in Jesus' day. And it was not particularly welcome news for some people. They had that, like, very much like our, our day, our day they drew rigid distinctions in borders, rigid distinctions in religion, rigid distinctions in political parties, just like we do. And the fact that he would proclaim, that Paul would say that they're co-partners, co-heirs, members of the same body, was not something that people had heard before. And it wasn't necessarily, as I say, something that people welcomed. Now we can say, well, intellectually we can say, well, that's, you know, thank God those early Christians and Jews got over it and those pagans and stuff. You know, we can kind of separate ourselves. But in reality, the issue is the same for us in every age. Because we're constantly drawing distinctions. It must be this person, but not that. It must only be Catholics. It must only be Christians. It must be only people in the Northern Hemisphere. It must be people only in the Western Hemisphere. Or whatever. However you do it. You know, let's build a fence on this border and something on that because there's a difference. There's a difference. Well, you know, one of the reasons, well, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that people killed Jesus was he didn't draw distinctions that people found important. He ate with sinners. He welcomed pagans, he healed people who were beyond the pale, he reached out across all kinds of social limits. And he, he invites us to see the world in a different way, not simply to say, oh, it's only us here, the Catholics and all of not, not those in Philly. <laughs> well, maybe it's only the Catholics and not the Christians. Well, maybe it's the Christians and not the Hindus, or not the Muslims, or not the Buddhists. You know, that mystery is one that Jesus' salvation, the, what God accomplishes in Jesus, 
is good news for all peoples. Uh, and he's inviting them to be co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise of Christ. This week, I'm going to uh, a national Catholic conference on immigration, the United States Catholic Conference, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, has invited every bishop uh, and all interested parties to, to a conference on how we can, on immigration and enforcing understanding and immigration reform and also the, you know, what's happening in the different states. So they're being invited all from, uh, uh, and they, it's something I'm intensely interested in. But where would you suppose that conference is going to be? Texas? Chicago? So maybe uh, San Francisco? Some place where... You know where the conference is? Salt Lake City. <laughs> Why Salt Lake City? Because the state of Utah has decided that they are not going to persecute the immigrants that live in Utah. Probably thanks, thank God, to the to the Mormon Church. They they haven't so the bishops decided we've got to go to a place where people already are beginning to understand that the, the the boundaries that we make, we've got to go to Utah and maybe pick up some of the uh, the atmosphere in a way that changes people's minds, like in Prince William County or in Alabama or in, in Arizona. You want to hear what the Utah Compact, this revolutionary document, is? There's just a couple of pieces on it. About a free society. This is from the Utah Compact. Immigrants are integrated into communities across Utah. We must adopt a humane approach to this reality, reflecting our unique culture, history, and spirit of inclusion. The way we treat immigrants will say more about us as a free society and less about our immigrant neighbors. Utah should always be a place that welcomes people of goodwill. Well, you know, the, 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 uh, on families, Strong families are the foundation of successful communities. We oppose policies that unnecessarily separate families. We champion policies that support families and improve the health, education, and well-being of all Utah children. You won't get a reading of this in Prince William County. In right? Arizona, they tear this up. The, so the challenge of Jesus, the news that that mystery that Paul talks about in Ephesians still challenges us today. When you return to your office tomorrow, I hope you return with an, with a, an inclusive uh, uh, mentality. It's not simply Utah or Alabama or Prince William. It is a challenge to all of us to recognize that the brothers and sisters that we live around and with, and recreate with, and work with, and work for, uh, are also called. And we're supposed to be the message of that inclusion, like, like Paul was. Paul never ceased, uh, after his conversion, after his revelation, to be a proclaimer and to defend him. To defend the fact that those who people could not have conceived before, uh, are, are sharing salvation. And so let us, let us take for ourselves our own mission. You know, not that everyone's going to welcome that. Right? You know, I think probably the people of, it, of Alabama think the people of Utah are crazy. You know? You know? But, uh, but the mystery that Paul talks about is the mystery of what Jesus revealed. And it is the bottom, one of the bottom lines.